Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another of our Skybound Capital webinars, the first in quite some time, and there's a good reason for that. I think during the course of 2020, as much as Zoom and Microsoft Teams and webinars became very much our norm, there was also the inevitable uh, webinar and Zoom fatigue. And uh, so we really wanted to wait for an opportunity to do something very special uh, to engage our staff from our Skybound Capital Global offices, clients, friends, associates. So we welcome people from South Africa, from Mauritius, from UK, from Geneva, our team in Australia, and uh, clients from around the world as well. It's wonderful to have you with us today uh, for an interaction that I've really been looking forward to bringing to you. It's with Mike Abel, who is something of an icon in the South African advertising, marketing and communications landscape. He co-led Ogilvy South Africa and ran the MNC Saatchi Group in Australia before returning to South Africa to found MNC Saatchi Abel in 2010. The company was named Advertising Agency of the Year in 2015 and 2019 and has evolved into a group, group comprising seven companies employing over 350 people and representing the advertising and communications interests of some of the country's most recognizable and popular brands. Now that kind of intro you could find uh, on places like Wikipedia and uh, the company website. But what I'd like to add from a personal point of view is that what I believe sets Mike apart is his unwavering positivity and desire to make things work in South Africa by nurturing entrepreneurship and speaking out against all forms of corruption and supporting NGOs. In his recent book, uh, Willing and Able, Mike shares lessons learned from a decade in crisis, the journey of building MNC Saatchi Able in often trying circumstances. They are lessons which highlight the power of trust in others, in teamwork, and to quote one of the chapters of the book, good intentions backed by action. Mike, it's wonderful to have you along with us today. Thank you in advance for your time. And perhaps if I could start by asking, is in your opinion, is the start of every significant journey good intent? morning, Matt, and good morning, everybody, and thank you for the warm introduction and the invitation to be here today. Yes, I guess that, um, you know, we are driven by hopefully more um, conscience in terms of what we choose to do in life than that which we believe is good for us, per se. And I think that if one's conscience drives one to make a difference, to, to want to get up off the chair and get one's hands dirty and drive positive change in the country without an ulterior motive, the chances of making or creating meaningful change are, are going to be far greater um, than people that do it for um, ulterior motives. Um, so I think that a lot of people like to pretend that they want to uh, create positive change, um, but in order to do it, it has to be without fear or favor. You have mm. to be able to take the punches uh, and roll with them. I'm going to just refer during the course of of our chat to your amazing book, which I've I've now read twice, and I will probably read it a third and a fourth time because there are so many valuable lessons in here and, and very uh, simply explained, and and there's a lot to take out of the book, but. Without going into too much detail, I, I referred in the introduction to your time at Ogilvy here in South Africa, and you went across to Australia. One of the things I wanted to, to pick out there was how it actually ended up not working out for, for you and your family, although you were very excited about the prospect. Um, a, a fabulous quote in your book was that a lesson learned is that always make sure that you don't move from something, but that you go to something. And in your instance, uh, on reflection, you felt that you'd moved away from something, which was South Africa, uh, but not necessarily for the right reasons. And it wasn't too long uh, before you took this opportunity to come back, face the challenges of South Africa at a critical time in the country's history, and to build a business here. Yes, I think that, um, you know, I had been at Ogilvy for 15 years, going on 16 years from age 25 to 41. And I had reached the top of the company and I was looking for challenge. 
a new opportunity, but you are absolutely correct. I mean, our decision to uh, immigrate, if you like, followed a very scary armed robbery with my children in the home. Uh, we were um, at my in-law's house in uh, Kwabeja, formerly known as Port Elizabeth, and um, uh, we were out to dinner and the lady, our nanny, who was looking after the kids, encountered people in the home and it was a very, very unpleasant uh, incident. And so, of course, that combined with the prospect of having somebody with innumerable criminal charges against him becoming our president at the time, unfathomable as it was. Uh, and then also the start of the implosion of our uh, electrical supply to the country being ESCOM. We started rolling uh, blackouts or load shedding as it's called. And so it was those things, I guess, that conspired to get us to look outside of South Africa for our children. Um, and we hadn't looked at it emotionally at all, Matt. We had looked at it entirely practically. Um, and as that famous philosopher Blaise Pascal said, the heart knows reason that reason knows nothing of. Uh, but we hadn't given in to any emotions around this thing. And then simultaneously, uh, I was approached by MNC Saatchi Group Australia. It's the largest communications company in that, on that continent. And uh, they were looking for a CEO. And um, it was a huge opportunity for me to take on a new challenge, to join a great company. I mean, they're an outstanding agency. Uh, and to go and live in one of the most beautiful cities in the world, which Sydney is. Um, and I had agencies in Melbourne as well, which isn't too bad a city either. So I you know, spent quite a lot of time between the two. When, in leaving South Africa, I was very traumatized, um, very traumatized leaving my company. I very much viewed Ogilvy as my company. I was traumatized leaving my family and my friends. My wife, Sarah, however, just wanted to be out of here. Um, and she didn't feel any trauma at leaving. And then when we got to Australia, um, literally as we walked into our house, um, Sarah looked at me and she said to me, my God, what have I done? And I said to her, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, I've left behind everything that I love and everything that I care for. And that is the reality. You know, the reality is that um, a lot of people do uh, emigrate for many different reasons. Um, but as I said, you know, go to, and, I, and, and, and it sounds very um, uh, disrespectful of the profound opportunity I was given to run the Australia company. And I don't want it to be that at all. You know, when one says, don't leave, rather go to. But one has to be emotionally honest with the decisions one makes in one's life. And the reality is that we did leave um, and that we hadn't viewed it as going to, despite it being an incredible opportunity. And I take nothing away from the agency or Sydney as a city is an incredible city, but it wasn't home, it wasn't familiar and it didn't talk to our hearts. And so we needed to return. Um, and I've always been hugely um, patriotic. So the decision was not for me. As I said, I left for my children and I came back for my wife. <laughs> but, uh, but the reality is, you know, I am an African and a South African through and through. I began my first ad agency during apartheid operating out of the townships in Nelson Mandela Bay, out of Zuide, Kwasakele, New Brighton, Motherwell, in partnership with Uncredo Black Taxi Association. So South Africa has always been a very key part of my fabric. And so it was great to be home despite the challenges. And going to MNC Saatchi in Australia actually created uh, indirectly this opportunity uh, to, to run an agency by not quite that name, uh, yes. but mo most of the name, because you became the first agency in that MNC Saatchi network globally to be able to, to add your name. And, and that was important. And, the, you know, the one thing, one of many things I've come to, to learn about you as we've grown to know each other is that uh, despite all your phenomenal success, there's no ego there, but but the name was important. It was important to tell uh, the industry, to tell potential clients that you're back, uh, and and that you are aligned with with a global powerhouse in the advertising and communications industry. Absolutely. Um, so when they asked me to start South Africa as part of my region, the intention was never for me to come back to South Africa. 
intention was for me to use my network in South Africa to start the company remotely and to build the group from Australia. But when I decided to head back to South Africa, I realized that the risk would be too great to simply call it MNC Saatchi because MNC Saatchi had been in South Africa before. In fact, they had tried to hire me when I was running Ogilvy uh, to start MNC Saatchi in South Africa. I don't think I even reflect on that in the book. Um, but um, I realized that unless I gave people a very clear headline uh, or banner as to where I was working, they would look for me either back at Ogilvy because uh, I was inextricably linked to that brand, or they'd look for me at Saatchi and Saatchi. Uh, because let's not forget uh, Morris and Charles Saatchi started Saatchi and Saatchi and built it into the biggest advertising agency in the world. Uh, and then they had a fallout with their uh, venture capital partners at the time and um, they broke away and started MNC Saatchi. But the reality is the brand confusion still today between our brand and uh, Saatchi and Saatchi is enormous. I mean, I sometimes have our clients call us Saatchi and Saatchi, and then I have to, you know, put up my hand and correct them and tell them that they've actually uh, come to the wrong agency, uh, fortunately. Um, but I think, mind you, I think that Saatchi and Saatchi are the far greater benefactors <laughs> in South Africa of the brand confusion. Um, but the interesting thing for me was really, as you say, it wasn't an ego-led thing or an affectation in any remote way. And I don't regard Able, us being MNC Saatchi Able, I don't see it as representing me at all. I think it represents the local flavor of me and my partners because MNC Saatchi Able, unlike most uh, advertising agencies around the world and certainly in South Africa is we structured much more Matt like a law firm or an, a, uh, an architectural practice where I just happen to be the senior partner in the practice but there are many senior partners and leaders that run the company so it's much more of a rectangle structure than a, a typical uh, hierarchical uh, triangle. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment the, the, the empowerment of people uh, as as a business strategy, but just before we get there, you know, I mentioned in the intro, advertising agency of the year 2015 2019, uh, hitting targets left, right, and centre. There's a there's a lot of uh, glamorous stuff around the growth of your agency, but I I think it's really important for the audience to understand something about the early days and the courage that one needs to have amidst to quote your book, Lessons from a Decade in Crisis, uh, coming to find opportunity amongst the chaos, but also uh, the circumstances under which you started. Yes, you had the backing of the Saatchi brothers, but that came with an extraordinary level of responsibility. And there's some wonderful pictures in the book of you having your first meeting with no furniture uh, in the office, sitting on the floor with one telephone, uh, trying to decide who to phone to pitch to, some wonderful anecdotes about opening an office in Johannesburg, Mike, with no staff, so that if you got an opportunity to pitch to a Joburg-based client, you could fly the staff up there for the day, pitch in your office and fly back. Uh, the, these were risks. They were risk-taking times, but ones that ultimately paid off handsomely. Yes, well, um, I returned to South Africa um, in December 2009 uh, with a full head of hair and opened the agency uh, six weeks later. Um, and, 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 and thus uh, the, re the receding, well, the non-existent hairline, I guess, started. Uh, so I think that I do have visual evidence of my battle scars and wounds. But the interesting thing is, you know, when I left South Africa, I was uh, co-leading the largest uh, communications group on the continent. You know, I had over 900 people across 12 operating divisions. When I was running the group in Australia, I had over 450 people across four different companies. And then when I came back, it was me. And I assembled a motley crew of 12 other lonely souls uh, with a, a big plan and a clear vision, uh, but with no revenue. Um, and as you say, no furniture either. And uh, I guess the thing that I had was uh, very, a very clear idea what our point of difference was going to be as a company. Um, and I've always been blessed, I guess, with optimism and tenacity. And I think you need both of those uh, characteristics. 
uh, and yeah, total determination. And um, it was interesting because those first few months, certainly, uh, I mean, it took us 18 months, Matt, to land our first major account, which happened to be uh, Heineken Group South Africa. Um, and then um, a few months later, we landed our first major account in Johannesburg, which was uh, the then very powerful Edcon Group and uh, Edgar's. And when we pitched for Edgar's, we pitched against three of South Africa's largest advertising agencies at the time. And we had six people in Johannesburg um, against companies that employed over 500 people each. Um, so yes, a lot of us flew up from Cape Town to Johannesburg to sit behind those desks and to create a sense of volume <laughs> and uh, operational capability. Uh, in landing at business, but it was really, we went from six to 12 to within a month, about 120 people in Johannesburg. So a very fast tracking in building it up. And um, it was, I guess, at no stage, and I can honestly say this, when I look back at no stage did I ever believe that M MNC Saatchi Abel was going to be anything but successful. I never allowed myself to go there. Um, because I've had one quote on my wall my entire career, and it's by a hockey coach called Jerry Welsh, and it says, the people with the best people win. And I think if you have the best people, you'll have the best company. By definition, you have to. Um, and so um, I believed I had an amazing team, which I did. Uh, and off that basis, self-belief and strategy, we managed to create something remarkable. But certainly um, what we did was we invested well ahead of the curve, because uh, as I said to, the, to, to Morris, the Lord Saatchi at the time, I said, give me enough money to build an international airport. And after um, you know, 18 months I'll, or after a year to two years, I'll start landing Dreamliners. But without building that airport, you can't land the big planes. Your strategy, that you refer to your strategy, your vision, uh, which was very clear to you. <clears throat> and I'd like to explore that because to those of us outside the advertising industry, if I can call it that, uh, you know, there are some very obvious things like creative and client service and copywriting, but perhaps the most underestimated uh, function with, within an agency environment is strategy because that's really where it all starts and, and those other components need to, to fit in around that. Do you see that and also given the people that you asked to join you on this journey from the very start, did, did you see strategy as, as being one of your key differentiators amongst the people uh, that you asked to join you? Yes, and uh, when they do industry uh, research, we are an agency still today that is probably most famous for our business strategy. There's something that is uh, inextricably linked to our brand. Um, so to answer your question, when I opened MNC Saatchi Able, I didn't call us an ad agency at all. I called us a strategic marketing and communications consultancy. And that is what we were. And then a number of friends of mine had put their accounts out to pitch in South Africa, and we weren't invited to pitch for those accounts. And so I phoned up the marketing director or the CEO of that company and I said, why didn't you invite us to pitch as a matter of interest? And they said, because you're not an ad agency, you're a strategic marketing and communications consultancy, and we're looking for an ad agency. And I said, oh, stop it, we're an ad agency. Let's just play into the convention so that people can understand what it is we do. But the other thing is that um, how do we know that, um, I guess, strategy and then creating resonant and compelling communication off that platform is what we do? Well, it's how we like to be measured, Matt. So when a client says, why should we appoint MNC Saatchi Abel? I say, because you're gonna hold us accountable for three things. How are we gonna grow your top line? How are we going to grow your market share? How are we going to grow your brand equity? You know, those are all very strategic pieces. Um, I don't talk to them about winning Lurie's or Can Lions. Obviously we like to win awards and it's lovely to get outside recognition of the work that we do. But ultimately, um, if it isn't built in those three specific areas, then what are you doing your advertising for? And to, to, to add to that, with 
great strategy comes research. Now, a, a, a very strong theme in our business at Skybound Capital is, is the quality of research that is conducted into the companies into which we invest or with which we partner. Uh, research is a key thing, and but not only the research itself, but the interpretation of that research uh, in building your strategy and your approach. That's right. And so uh, we believe that uh, that research is, is critically important. I mean, we are, I think for any company to be successful, you need to be a customer centric uh, organization. You know, otherwise you end up going the way of the wind like a Kodak or like a Blackberry or a Nokia, where you can absolutely dominate and own a category, but not being able to be customer focused and being able to evolve with their needs or their latent needs, or their, you know, um, you, you, you miss the opportunity. And I guess that is, has been the genius of a Steve Jobs and that has been the genius of a, of a Jeff Bezos, you know, the, the ability to anticipate what people would want and to give it to them, as opposed to playing into the, the traditional space. So we look very much at um, taking brands from the contested space and into the open space. Um, because I think that if you aren't customer centric, uh, and to be customer centric, you have to understand it. And you have to understand the companies, you know, we've done a lot of acquisitions. You need to understand uh, the, the businesses that you invest in intimately. And that, that's where the research comes into it. Often just to determine whether or not you also have aligned ambition because, you know, um, a, a deal or an acquisition or a partnership will never work unless you have aligned ambition. Um, there's a wonderful saying about research, um, which is uh, research can be like a lamppost. Either it can be used for illumination or, a, or like a drunk, uh, you can lean on it for support. And I think that the people that lean on research for support, not for illumination, are the ones who, uh, who make bad decisions. Where, you know, you've got to use research often to corroborate things. And I've, at the end of the day, often refuted the research where my gut has told me that the research is wrong. I mean, I can tell you a great story if you like about Please. research. So many years ago in 1994, um, City Golf uh, was 10 years old and I was looking after the brand when I was at Ogilvy, I was uh, running the company, but VW still remained my, my baby. And we came up with this ad because the brand was 10 years old, everybody was worrying about the age of the brand. Uh, and the age of the car, because the car was designed in 1978. And uh, we said, well, let's play into the fact that it's an old car, that it's been around in terms of reliability. And so we came up with this ad, which some of you may remember. It was put to uh, Sunny and Shiz, a track, I've Got You, Babe. And it was a guy who went to a tattoo, uh, tattoo parlor and he had his girlfriend's name put on his arm and then she would break up with him. And then you'd go back in his city golf to that tattoo parlor and put the next girlfriend's name. And so it went on. Eventually he was jilted at the, um, at the uh, altar and he went, goes back at the end and he has city golf tattooed. And it basically says, if only everything was as reliable as a city golf. So we got the research and uh, the night before we were going to shoot the ad. So this was pre-testing of the concept. The research came back to say, in the black market, if you have a tattoo, it means you've been to jail. So bear in mind, this is 1994, with very little insight into the black market. And, um, uh, and we strongly recommend you never make this ad, you never shoot this ad. So I looked at this research and I thought, well, why would the black market think that this guy has got the tattoo in jail when they've seen him go into the tattoo parlor and have it put on his arm with his girlfriend. So your gut and your intuition tells you immediately that it's nonsensical. So I said to BW, um, I refute this research, it's rubbish, we have to make the ad. And the client said to me, well, as long as you make us another ad, if the post-testing comes back and shows that as being problematic. And I said, now I'm happy that we bear the risk. And we went and we shot the ad and then in the post-testing, not one person mentioned that because the guy had a tattoo, he had been to jail. You know, and so we had paid a lot of money for this from a very reputable research company, but it was rubbish. <laughs> but doesn't that highlight uh, the fine line that you walk in this industry but between 
perception and reality because your and my perception of the same topic might be uh, dramatically different in, in, in some terms. And, and the way people, consumers, customers, potential customers interpret a piece of communication might be different uh, to the way in which it was intended. How, how fine is that line? I think it's a very fine line if, you know, John Le Carre, who wrote, uh, I think, A Spy Who Came In From The Cold, uh, wrote a wonderful line. He said, a desk is a dangerous place from which to view the world. And um, if you uh, view your, the world around you from um, a place of privilege or removed from society and not understanding all factors and all facets of society, you can uh, get yourself into a lot of trouble. Uh, you can do advertising that offends, you can um, do uh, communication that uh, alienates. But if you live amongst the people and are of the people uh, and are passionate and curious and interested in all South Africans and how they live their lives, well, whichever country you live in, I guess, the chances are you're not going to make a mistake. So it's the people who are removed, you know, who don't have empathy and don't have insight and don't have passion and curiosity for people and for the human condition. You know, a lot of people think that um, communication has to be hyper-local, or it doesn't really, Matt. You know, when you go to the movies, whether or not you are watching Jerry Maguire in Cape Town or Beijing or New York or London, People are going to laugh at the same time and people are going to cry at the same time. It's called the human condition. And so if you understand the human condition and you're empathetic to people, chances are that you will uh, that you'll get it right. It's only when there is kind of like uh, local dynamics, cultural uh, differences, all of that, that you then need to, to, to play into that. And the other thing that's really important, I guess, beyond research is your gut feel. And people think gut is an instantaneous response to something. No, it's not. You know, there's a wonderful story. You know, I often make very big calls in meetings with clients, multi, multi million uh, dollar calls around certain things. And uh, sometimes a client will say to me, it's taken you very quick to get to that decision. And it reminds me of the story of this lady who bumps into Picasso in a coffee shop. And she's blown away because she's uh, you know, a huge fan of his painting. And she goes up to him and she says, Mr. Picasso, this is a defining moment for me. Can you just give me a little squiggle just to say that I've met you? And so he takes out his napkin and he draws a little eye and a nose and he signs at Picasso and he passes it across the table and he says, that'll be $5 million. And she said, but it took you 10 seconds. And he said, no, it took me 70 years. And that is what gut feel is. It's your cumulative knowledge and experience and hard knocks and wins that comes to play at that moment that leads to think this is what needs to happen. But also we, we do have a tendency to overthink things. A, a theme in the book, and it, indeed it's a theme that permeates across the MNC Saatchi group is this concept of brutal simplicity of thought. Do you think we overanalyze? Do we overthink and that, actually uh more often than not your first instinct is is what should be guiding the way you proceed so i'm not sure if it's one's first instinct matt per se but i definitely think that most people play the business game of risk aversion as opposed to being opportunity led so i actively play to win as opposed to playing not to lose um, and so if you're going to play a defensive game in business, you're not going to be brave, you're not going to invest ahead of the curve, you're not going to take those chances, all you're going to do is mitigate risk. Now that's fine if you um, some wealthy old codger and all your, your focus and attention is on wealth preservation. But for those of us that are, you know, on the front lines of business, or sport or whatever it might be, um, with the cut and thrust of changes, of new tactics, of new strategies, of new competitors, you have to play to win in order to win. And that is why a lot of companies today are not growing, um, are receding, because they want to sail too close to the shore. 
They don't want to uh, discover new lands as that metaphor goes. And, uh, and sometimes you need to lose sight of the shawl. Sometimes you just need to say, stuff it, we're gonna try this. You know, it might be one hell of a failure, but it might be one hell of a success. You know, you look at uh, Naspers um, and that $38 million investment they put into that fledgling um, e-commerce business called Tencent. Um, and how that investment in Tencent today accounts for the total value of Nasco's uh, and how to turn, I guess, $38 million in, into over a trillion. Um, that was bravery. That is a, a, a powerful investment and the return has been exponential. Uh, I'm sure there was every reason in the book not to invest in Tencent and probably, um, you know, I actually had a stockbroker because at the time I wanted to invest in the company. And they said to me, based on all of their research, I should not invest in the company. Um, fortunately, um, I did. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have to be able to see it. You have to be able to see the opportunity much greater than seeing the limitations. And there's a curious thing in people's minds. Do you know that a person who finds fault in meetings is considered more intelligent than somebody who is enthusiastic about doing everything? Do you know that? And so actually the fault finder is the one that is listened to more than the person that spots the opportunity. Uh, and that is why we don't see too many innovative solutions in big corporates today, because the very people that founded those companies are not sure that a Richard Branson would even pass the test to get a job at uh, Virgin today. Um, he may well do. I don't know what their, what their process is, but often the mavericks who come up with these brilliant ideas and start the companies, by the time they become big and successful, their whole motivation is risk aversion, not growth. Mm -hmm. Mike, this may be a very generic uh, question for, for a short period of time that we have, but it's an important one. I wanna talk about the communications landscape that we're in, not just in South Africa, but globally. You have some very strong views on social media. You're active on social media, but you also see the scourge of social media and, and the damage that it can cause. Maybe you can touch on your feelings towards that, but also the communications landscape that we exist in, that your business exists in, and how media consumption habits have changed and how you need to adapt and evolve as a business in order to accommodate those? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question, Matt, because um, certainly what I've seen in my career is I entered one industry and I found myself in another in terms of the challenges that the, uh, that the communication industry has, um, I guess, gone through with um, the internet and the power of social media. Because when I started my career, you really would um, have a very a clear thing between something called above the line and below the line. And then above the line, the way you communicated with customers was uh, totally through uh, putting stuff out there and nothing came back at you at all. So you had television and you had radio and you had cinema and you had outdoor uh, and you had press and magazines. Um, and so there was, unless uh, you know, your customer wrote a letter to the press or a letter to the advertising agency, about the ad, uh, you really didn't know what people thought out there other than uh, were people buying the stuff or not. You know, today with social media, everybody has an opinion and an equal opinion. Uh, and that's the most terrifying thing. You know, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, you know, so whether you are a professor of philosophy or whether you are somebody uh, who has studied nothing and isn't interested in, um, a society in the world and you're not curious, you have an equal opinion on most matters, I suppose, just like having an equal vote in an, in a, in an election. Um, and we've seen, you know, not that I'm not a favor, uh, in favor of democracy, I'm passionate about, about democracy, but one also has to understand the threats and perils of democracy and where that can get you. So um, when you look at communication today and social media, unfortunately, um, and it depends which platform you are talking about. 
but uh, certainly social media has the most profound opportunity to change the world for good. It also has the most profound ability to destroy the world and humanity. And uh, right now I'm extremely concerned about the role of social media because um, I think that most people's motivations uh, on certainly platforms like Twitter, um, it becomes a platform of hate. Um, you know, the, I don't know what's happened to uh, liberalism. Um, I, as I often say, the left has left the left, has left the left. You know, I am, I was a lefty in the olden days. I consider myself today to be a centrist. But, you know, when you look at social media today, um, the cancel culture is enormous. Um, the deliberate misinterpretation of what somebody has said looking how you can find fault, looking how you can be offended, looking how you can destroy people's careers and lives. Uh, it's unimaginable. You know, um, the late chief rabbi, Lord Harris, um, uh, sorry, Lord Sachs, Lord Harris was the local uh, chap, uh, Jonathan Sachs, said we live in an unforgiving age. And that to me is the biggest problem right now, Matt. So for brands, it's a huge opportunity and it's also a huge curse. Uh, and you've got to be able to walk that fine line that you talk about uh, very, very carefully because um, you, know, you can do a piece of work. You know, we've got uh, a lot of brands that engage very actively with South Africa and we want them to engage very actively with South Africa and South Africans like a Nando's. Um, and that Nando's very clearly puts its head above the parapet and um, brings um, intelligence, insight, and important conversation to the country in a lot of their communication, which we call the voice of the people. So talking to what people are feeling and giving relief to what people are feeling and giving insight to what people are feeling. But of course, when you're doing that, you also stand uh, out in terms of being able to being attacked as a brand. Um, fortunately, between my team and their team, or we are really one team, I don't know where Nando's ends and the agency begins. That's a very uh, wonderful relationship, but um, we are very aware at all times of the, the risk you run by having an opinion. You know, I mean, many years ago, well, not that many years ago, about three or four years ago, we uh, had an insight that as South Africans, we're incredibly resilient people. Um, and as a result of our resilience, we fix our shift. So I don't know if you remember that Nando's ad, you know, as South Africans, you know, we, we, we basically attack and fix that which is broken. And at the end of the ad, you see the Gupta brothers um, running away, leaving their house in Saxonwold from where they ran the country, running towards their car, carrying big bags of cash. Um, and uh, that was three months before the Guptas ran away from South Africa with big bags of cash. Now, at the time we ran that ad, they were uh, in power uh, with um, uh, Jacob Zuma. Um, I'm reluctant to call him President Zuma because I didn't see a presidency, I saw kleptocracy. But, um, you know, to be able to call it out before it happens is extremely brave on behalf of the brand. And that's those kind of calculated risks that you have to take in order to be authentic to the brand and in order to be loyal to your customers. Um, and to be able to empower people in society. So the long and the short of it, I think is, yes, I think social media today for brands, engage with your customers, understand your customers. If you get negative feedback, work with the negative feedback. Don't try and shut the customer down. The customer will always have the final word or social media will always have, so work with it, go with it. Try bring sobriety, try bring insight, try, bring a, a conversation. The reality is most haters, haters will hate as they say. And at certain things you just need to, you know, it's the good old thing about, uh, you've got to work out when you're pouring fuel on the fire or when you're pouring water on the fire. And oftentimes today with social media, anything you say and do will be held against you no matter if it is a, sub, a sober or insightful thing. So always try and work around it and try and bring sanity or disengage. But to shut it down, um, it'll take on a, often take on a laugh of its own. Mm. I, I doubt there's anyone on this call who hasn't engaged a Nando's commercial uh, without uh, the corners of their mouth just turning up because 
very cleverly and subtly, uh, a lot of that communication addresses issues within the country. You mentioned one of them. There's been uh, the Say My Name uh, campaign as well. So just, just a wonderful opportunity to work with an open-minded client. Uh, another client that I'd like to touch on without breaching confidentiality or anything, and, and because it's so relevant to the South African audience on this webinar, because I can tell you the number of uh, take-a-lot boxes that arrive at a reception at, at Skybound Capital uh, tells a story uh, of success, uh, especially during the last year when conventional retail was under enormous pressure. But maybe a little bit about that journey, Mike, you know, from really from startup. Uh, to, to, to what Take A Lot has become today. But again, in partnership, where, where does the business end and the agency begin? It's a very blurry line because it's been a strategic journey together for you. Absolutely. So um, we have been together with Take A Lot, uh, or as it started, Take Two, since inception. Uh, so the journey actually began when I was the managing director of, uh, of Ogilvy Cape Group. And uh, my client to take a lot, the founder of Take a Lot, Kim Reed, at the time was the uh, CEO of MWeb. And that is how we met. Uh, and then we both went on to do different things. And then Kim phoned me um, shortly uh, after we opened the agency. And he said to me, I've uh, acquired a, a company uh, called uh, Take Two. Um, they deliver, they're an e-commerce business, um, they deliver books and CDs and a couple of other things, and I want to build it into um, South Africa's uh, next great e-commerce company, um, or into a great e-commerce company. And um, we met and we sat down and we chatted about the business, um, and uh, it's interesting, you know, the first thing we look for in a business map is what is the enemy of the business? So if you had to say to Phil Knight of Nike, who is the enemy of Nike? People would think he would say Adidas or Puma. He won't. He'll say apathy. Because I know if I get more people off the couch and moving, then I can sell more sneakers. And so we looked at um, the competitors like Kalahari at the time. And we said, who would be the enemy of take two? And the enemy would be instant gratification. In South Africa, when people want something, they want it now. They don't want to wait. And it can take often, uh, well, with Kalahari, it would take a week to 10 days before your TV set or whatever would arrive from there. So, um, well, they weren't selling TVs per se, but your book or your, your DVD. And so the first thing we needed to do was to address instant gratification. So we had a tiny uh, client in the agency called Mr. Delivery, Mr. D. And so um, Kim and I discussed it and I phoned the uh, CEO of Mr. D and I said to the guy, Dave, tell me, what do you, all of your drivers do when they're not delivering lunch or supper? He said, well, it's quite quiet for us. So uh, Kim and I discussed uh, them getting together and he met with them and he liked them very much and he acquired it. So that they, when they weren't delivering Nando's, punt for my client there, for lunch or for supper, they could be delivering TV sets and tackies and tennis rackets and everything else. And so being able to deliver within 24 to 48 hours was the big game changer. Uh, and then Kim said, well, why take two when you can take a lot? Uh, and so we rebranded the company takealot.com and we've literally been their communication partners involved in every aspect of their business uh, since then. And uh, I can't tell you, as I said you know, earlier about Nanas, I can't tell you where Take A Lot ends and the agency begins, but it's a very, very tight strategic partnership. You spoke about strategy earlier. Of course, we're the advertising agency and we work with them across Mr. D Food and across Superbolus. Um, and, uh, and with great love and, and, and success. Uh, but that is the thing. You need to be able to live in your client's world in order to be um, uh, an invaluable partner. You can't live in agency world. Mm. Mike, time has flown and we don't have much time left. There's a couple of things that I'd really like to get to. Um, one of them being, and it's in part, it's about the social media discussion, returning to that. You've put yourself out there in a big yes. way. Yes. Uh, 
and and that's risky in itself i would think for for a business mm-hmm. leader a prominent uh, business leader in south africa but it talks to your abhorrence if i can call it that of any kind of uh, systemic corruption it it can be government it can be corporate you've been outspoken on all levels um do you do a risk assessment around that or, or do you see it as an absolute prerequisite for building an environment in which South Africa can be successful? Yes, for me, it's not a matter of choice, Matt. It's a matter of conscience. Um, you know, you look at South Africa and the pain of South Africa that it's gone through during the years of apartheid uh, and the miracle of our democracy and the, the clear leadership that Madiba although um, a lot of Twitter today likes to say he was a sellout. Uh, He was the greatest statesman that possibly ever lived, Um, a genius of a man. And uh, the opportunity for transformation in this country and for upliftment for all and for creating a sharing economy and inclusive culture uh, was and is still profound. You know, South Africa has an abundance of wealth. You know, you look at, uh, you know, a, a little country that has no natural assets, in fact, nothing going for it, and is surrounded by enemies like Israel, which is one fifth the size of KwaZulu-Natal. And you look at their GDP, and you look at the tech boom, and you look at what they've created uh, second in tech outside of Silicon Valley, and you look at South Africa and our agriculture and our mines and our tourism and the talent of our people, South Africa could be one of the big global players. We have everything here. There's nothing that South Africa doesn't have other than the will from a government point of view uh, and, and, and many political parties, not just the ANC, but many political parties to actually muck in and fix the place and create an inclusive and sharing economy. Um, and a lot of them pretend. But the first thing is you cannot have a winning company or a winning country if you're putting inept people who know if all about their portfolios into those jobs, how on earth are you going to have a successful portfolio? So as long as there's cadre deployment, and as long as there is uh, uh, jobs for polls, and as long as there's cronyism, uh, there isn't going to be success. And we have to fight against that. Um, I have a complete intolerance of intolerance. Okay, It's well ingrained in me. You know, I grew up in a family where I understood the perils of intolerance because my grandmother, who's Polish, saw what happened to her entire family as a result of intolerance and hatred that she left behind in Poland. And so I fought actively against any form of racism, any form of sexism, any form of sexual orientation intolerance, any form of gender intolerance. Any of those are are triggers for me. And I'll get out of bed like a Don Quixote, and I'll head towards those windmills with my jousting stick every day to fight against that. And I find uh, where the country is at right now, still having pit toilets in school, people running off with the money that is meant to be life-saving in terms of PPE and COVID, the lack of, in- of thought that has gone into some of the lockdown stuff, and I'm not saying for a second that I didn't support the first lockdown, And I'm not saying for a second that I don't believe uh, support wearing masks, social distancing and hand sanitizing, I do emphatically. But I think that a lot of the decisions that we made didn't take people's lives into consideration and livelihoods and livelihoods made equal lives. You know, the level of starvation, what we've done to to, to so many industries in South Africa to now have this nagging rollout process for the vaccine I find reprehensible. So these things that I feel need to be tackled and challenged, I'm totally apolitical. I don't have a political support party that I actually support. I'm trying to support the country and its people. I don't want to see pit toilets. I don't want people to go into hospital where there's no mattress on the bed, um, where there's filth around them. And so I think that what we need in South Africa is active citizenry. And that is what I do on social media. And I understand the risks and I understand them well. But unfortunately, I'm not prepared to shut up because why should I shut up when I'm trying to fix the country and to try and bring sobriety in my own little way? I mean, nobody's given me the mandate to do this other than just being a a South African like anybody else. But why would you not try and fix the country from the bottom up, not the top down? You know, I'm not interested in privilege and wealth. 
I'm try interested in job creation and creating an opportunity for people's children to have a far better future. And what I can't work out is why would people continually vote against that? Mm. Why would you not vote for it? Why would you not get out of bed and, uh, and actively seek to make this country better? And so when people say to me, Mark, you're very outspoken against the country. No, I'm not. I'm trying to fix it, first and foremost. But patriotism is about calling out that which is wrong. Patriotism isn't going with the flow and turning a blind eye to that which is broken. And there are other forms of perhaps more subtle active citizenry, which uh, you subscribe to. Uh, one such example, the art uh, in, your, in your office, uh, which is incredible, your support of, of local art. And a, a quick word perhaps as well uh, around street store. Uh, which is a concept that you uh, conceptualized and then rolled out across uh, the MNC Saatchi group. Yes. So um, I've always had a, uh, a passion for uh, contemporary South African art. I was very fortunate uh, to grow up in a home where my father had uh, art galleries in uh, Nelson Mandela Bay, Kwabeja, uh, and uh, uh, developed a love at an early stage and understood the power of art and creativity uh, to communicate important messages. And so the MNC Saatchi Able Contemporary Collection, um, which I finance personally, um, is all about giving an opportunity to up and coming and talented artists. Uh, we've got behind art in a very significant way in South Africa. We all, did all of the strategy, all of the branding, um, and donated a sizable amount of money at the time to the Zeit Smoker in Cape Town, which we saw as a big opportunity to put contemporary South African art um, onto uh, you know, people's uh, radar. Um, and we like to collect um, young and upcoming artists. Um, I mean, the other day I bought a, a wonderful piece from an artist called Bandele Njadai. Uh, he lives in uh, the Warmer Township in Kwabeja, self-taught artist, does the most incredible art. Uh, and he did a painting which really resonated with me. I think I showed it to you, Matt, when you visited the agency once, which is behind the reception desk, which is uh, a piece called Sis Nkresi. And it's a woman who every day gets up and basically does the washing uh, in a, a pre-primary school to ensure that even with poor hygiene conditions, she keeps the kids um, safe and healthy. And it's a really beautiful piece. And you can look at it and you can identify so many women that you know in that painting. But even then, when I posted that, uh, we got back backlash on social media from the cancel culture brigade who've contributed nothing to the discourse or contributed to buying contemporary art or anything, who called it poverty art. I mean, it was completely insulting to Banele, completely insulting to uh, Sissim Gresi, and completely insulting to me to call it that. But I believe that we have to get behind art. I mean, behind me, I've got a Nelson Makamo. As you know, he is one of the uh, golden boys of South African art globally. Uh, you'll find his work in the homes of Giorgio Armani, of Oprah Winfrey, of Kanye West today, Trevor Noah. He's been this, this was the cover of Time magazine. Uh, our art is right up there with the best in the world. We've got unbelievable artists that the uh, Ati Patarugas, the Mohamo Disa Kings, um, the Mary Sabandis that are doing the most incredible work uh, that is being recognized globally. And so I encourage people to be interested in it. And from a, um, a skybound capital point of view, it's also a damn good investment. You know, so art is not just something that you can love and enjoy, but it's also, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good and appreciating investment, uh, which is not lost on me either. Um, then I'll talk to you about the street store very quickly because you asked me about that. So in 2014, uh, one of the young creative guys in my agency, a man called Max Patsak, he had only been uh, out of the industry for a year, first year in advertising. And he noticed, uh, no, a little bit more than that, probably second or third year. He noticed a, a number of homeless people in the area and because we've got in our green, where we are in Greenpoint or Devata country, we've got the Haven Night Shelter around the corner. And so we have a lot of homeless people in the area. And to quote that famous line from Game of Thrones, uh, winter was coming. 
and uh, he noticed these people had threadbare clothing. And so he thought, how can we contribute towards clothing these people? And so he came up with a, a gem of an idea called the street store. Uh, he was working with a talented uh, copywriter at the time, a, a lady called uh, Kaylee Leviton. And they took this idea to Gordon Ray, our executive creative director, one of the co-founders of the company. And Gordy phoned me and he said, Mike, you need to come down to my office. Uh, and Jason Harrison who's the MD and he shared this idea. And the idea basically is the world's first rent-free, premises-free, free pop-up clothing store for the homeless. Um, so basically it comprises four posters that you put up and you invite people to bring clothing. And then the homeless can have their first genuine dignified shopping experience where they can choose clothing that they want, that they like, and, and that fits them. Um, and then we decided to go open source, which means that we put all of the how to run a street store online, all of the material to host a street store uh, online, and people could download it and sign a pledge. And today, if it hadn't been for COVID, by the time COVID hit, we were on almost a thousand street stores globally. We've clothed over half a million people, and it's become a global movement for clothing the homeless. And it gives dignity to both the recipient and the giver of the clothing. Yeah. I'd encourage anybody on this call to just go and do a little bit of background research on Street Store and see how you can contribute. And it's pertinent that we're almost done there, Mike, because it was around a street store in Somerset Road in Greenpoint that you and I uh, really reconnected after a connection very early before you even went to Australia. Um, and it was at the time of the Cape Town Sevens rugby and, and we saw a collective opportunity. And, and since then we've had an increasing number of conversations. And I just want to acknowledge in this forum, the role that you have played. Uh, we have a number of people on this call from uh, Skybound Australia's, uh, Skybound Capital's Australia business, business and businesses in which we invested in Australia. And uh, through a connection that, that you made uh, between me and, and Justin Graham, you know, I'm delighted to, to say that uh, our Australian team is engaged with MNC Saatchi uh, Australia and, and that things are, are rolling very quickly uh, and positively. And I, I just wanted to, to thank you for that. And, and what that brings me to in closing is a, another theme throughout your book is trust in people and, and empowerment of, of people. And I dare say that that you wouldn't have made that introduction uh, if if you didn't trust Matt Pierce and 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 you didn't have faith in what we could achieve and that we wouldn't misrepresent you uh, in any way. And I hope we've delivered on that. But but it is a two way street, um, and it's been a very powerful tool. Uh, let's come back to your quote uh, behind your desk uh, about people and and how important. Uh, they have been in, in achieving what you've achieved. Yes, I think that's right, Matt. And absolutely, um, I think that uh, my asset test for uh, doing business with people, firstly, I ask three questions. Do I know them? Do I like them? Do I trust them? Before I even get to do they have the requisite skill? And fortunately, you and I have uh, that relationship, which is one of high trust and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and liking one another and respecting one another. So you always have to have a land ambition. And without a land ambition, you have nothing uh, in terms of building something together. Um, and uh, you know, my, my, what I always say to my people um, is, I don't believe trust is earned. I believe trust is lost. So I give people my trust openly and willingly from the get go because I choose not to live my life as an untrusting person or a distrusting person. Um, and then um, people either build on that trust that's been given to them or they break that trust. Um, so I think that it's a much better and much richer way to live your life is to surround yourself with good people, good quality people, and then give them, uh, give them your trust and let them make mistakes or be at the same mistake only once. Um, and then uh, you know, empower them. Uh, and they'll surprise and delight you. You know, I always say in an organization, scared people make mistakes. Scared people mitigate risk. They don't bring you opportunity. And so what I've tried to do is to create a playground here for curious and imaginative people. Yeah. And I like our clients. I like to work with clients who are curious and imaginative. 
because with high trust then and aligned ambition, you can unlock any opportunity. Mike, it's been amazing. I, I feel like we could carry on for another hour. An hour has flown by and uh, dark to still be more interactions. And as I said to you before the call, I've had a wonderful cortada at your office uh, and seen your artwork. Uh, the next stage is uh, to have you for a, a, a cortado or a cappuccino at the Skybound offices and to uh, explore the art collection here as well. But I thank think again, on behalf of our Australia team who are on the call, thank you uh, for what you've done there. And also on behalf of all of us for, for the vision, for the leadership uh, that you've shown uh, and the faith that you've shown, notwithstanding all the challenges, the decade in crisis, you've proved along with another person who went to the same school as you, our Springbok captain, Sia Kolisi, that we can indeed be stronger together. And that we, when we pull together, uh, there is so much that in our diversity uh, we can achieve. So much of uh, Mike's experience is contained in the book. I know a lot of you on the call have the book. If you would like to get a copy, you don't have one, please get in touch with me or with Kate. Uh, and with that, Mike, a, a heartfelt thank you from me. And I'm just going to hand over to Kate to say a, a few final goodbyes. Thank you, Matt. I've enjoyed the conversation enormously. Appreciate it. By having worked in the advertising world for a couple of years, I've always been a huge admirer of your work and your team dynamic. And I couldn't agree more with, it's all about the people around you. Um, so thank you so, so much for your time this morning. We really appreciate it. Um, and like Matt said, if anyone hasn't read the book, get your hands on one of those. It's definitely a worthwhile read. Um, and if anyone wants to have a look at any of our previous recorded webinars, you can go to our website and click on the media and insights tab and check out all our previous webinars as well. But thank you so, so much, Matt, Mike and Matt, and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, thank Kate. Kate. Thank you, Kate. And thanks to Ross for putting it together, to, to Cliff for, for hosting us. I think uh, the insights shared today have, have been extraordinary, thought provoking. And, and Mike, again, thank you so much. Have a, a, a good day and a good rest of the week, everyone. Great pleasure. Thank you. Take care, everybody.